This video is sponsored by Rhizom Lab, the creators of my unwrapping software of choice, Rhizom UV. During the upload month of this video, my viewers can enjoy a 20% discount on Rhizom UV by going to rhizomlab.com and using the code DIGITALMEAT at the checkout. I will also be giving away free licenses for Rhizom UV during this month, so make sure you're following me on Facebook and keep an eye out for those giveaway posts. Hey guys, it's Sam for Digital Meat, and this video is going to be a update video for Ryzen UV. Now, the last time that I recorded an update video for Ryzen was way back in, I think, June 2020. Now, Ryzen Labs have actually had quite a few releases between the last time I did uh, that update video and this video. So, this video is going to include all these significant updates, changes, uh, new tools, all that kind of thing. So uh, without further ado, let's get on with it. Okay, so here we are in Ryzen UV Virtual Spaces 2022. But before I talk about anything to do with the program, I'd like to talk about my controls. As you all know, I am a C4D user, and I like my controls in Ryzen UV to reflect that. So if you go to Edit, Keyboard Mouse Customizer, um, go to this drop down, and I change mine to Cinema 4D and then I can save and close that. So if you're using another control layout and there's things that I'm pressing that don't relate to what you're doing, you can uh, see how to do exactly the same thing by going to the help select. And here is a beautiful list of the button mouse combinations to do things like orbit, zoom, and all the rest of it. So with that out of the way, let's talk about the program itself. First, I want to talk about some of the quality of life updates and changes, uh, things that I can talk about quite quickly and easily, and we'll just go over a few of those now. One of the first things you may notice is changes to the UI. Some of the icons, uh, particularly the space in between them, that kind of thing has been changed, just so it doesn't look so cluttered. It's a very welcome change indeed. There are now drop downs where there wasn't before. If I go to the packing properties up here, actually, you can see that these are now drop downs. Some things have been shifted around as well. The select menu over here is a good example. If you can't see that, you can just uh, scroll that down there. Uh, the order of these have been changed, uh, so they make a lot more sense. And you'll also notice that these marquee tools are now here. Uh, before, they used to be on the left side uh, down here, I believe. But because they are to do with selection, it makes sense that they are in the select menu. If we go back to the packing properties pane, this accuracy, this drop down is much the same options as we had before, but you'll notice that the iterations have been scaled back somewhat. I think before this went up to a quite a high number like 16,000. And I know that if you add this on ultra and then try to do that many iterations, it would be a nightmare. It would probably bring your computer to its knees. So that's been scaled back and reflected in here now. Another option we have is what primitive mode we're in at startup. So if we come over here to the left, you can see that we've got points, edges, polygons, and island mode. Now we can tell Ryzen UV which one of these we want selected when the program starts up. So we can do that by going to Edit, Preferences, and here you'll see Startup Primitive Mode. Mine's currently set to Edge, but you can choose whether it's Vertex, Polygon, islands and groups. I prefer mine to be on edge and that's mainly because when I export something to Ryzen UV the first thing I want to do is make cuts so I'm going to leave it on edge for now. Another option we've got in preferences now is text size with the advent of uh, high definition screens particularly ones with uh, high dots per inch you may want to make your text bigger so you've now got the option of small and big. Uh, I like to leave mine at auto because my screen is a 1440p screen and uh, it seems to suit me fine. We also have uh, better import-export settings. So if we go all the way down to the bottom here, you'll see import-export. I like to export my models out of my 3D program into Ryzen UV as FBXs, whether that's just exporting FBXs or using the bridge. But this is great because... Um, 
I can demonstrate why this is going to be a good thing for me. So if I go and open Cinema 4D now, there we go. So I'm going to go up to File, Export, and then go down to FBX. Uh, I'm currently using Cinema 4D R21. Uh, this may apply to whatever 3D program you're using, but if I go to the FBX version, I can see that the highest it goes in Cinema 4D R21 is actually 7.5, which is 2016. So if I make a note of that and go back to Ryzen, I can see that this is set to 2017-2018. Uh, so to ensure compatibility, I'm going to actually choose 2016. There's also some other options for FBXs, such as FBX order UV sets by their name. Um, and we've got some other options in there as well. I'm actually generally okay with what's here at the moment, so I'll leave them as they are. Okay, now we're going to have a look at backface rendering. I've just imported this simple shape into Ryzen UV. It's just this kind of uh, box with half its sides missing. Um, so what I'll do is I'll, in fact, I'll just select every edge. I'm in edge mode, control A, I'm going to press C to cut. And then in an empty space, I'm going to press U to unfold them. Let's press F to frame in this side of the screen here. If I spin around the back side of this shape, nothing seems different and uh, nothing seems different on this side either. So you can actually tell whether you're looking at a backside or the front side of a polygon in Ryzen UV now. So if we go to Edit, Preferences dialog again, we have an option for Backface Render Mode. It's currently set to both. By default, it is actually uh, set to Coloured, and I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to choose that now. So now it's set to Coloured. Let's close this. And if I go around the back of this, you can see that now we've got this blue teal color signifying that this is a back face. This is extremely helpful because if you have a model that's come out of your 3D program and the <laughs> polygons have been inverted somehow, maybe it was an accident using a symmetry tool or something like that, you know Im immediately inside of Ryzen UV. Also, it signifies flipped UV polygons as well. So if I go into island mode, grab this uh, face here and then go to a line and flipped and we'll flip it along its center axis you can see that we can tell that this is a flipped uv polygon in this screen now so let's just flip that back we'll select it flip it back now we're looking at the correct side of it and uh, there you go that is back face rendering something else that we can have a look at while we're here if i go into edge mode and I select one of the edges we cut, you can see that there is now a line connecting this edge here to this edge here. And that is basically telling you that these edges are connected in the 3D space. So if we have a look here, we can see that these two polygon faces are connected together via this cut edge. And this is just letting you know where that cut edge is in UV space. So from here to here. So if I was to weld this by selecting this edge in the UV space, you can see it's highlighted here. I know that when I weld it, this edge will be welded to this edge. So let's just do that quickly. we we'll go up to weld and click weld. And now you can see that this has been moved to our edge and re-welded. I'm just going to control Z this and put it back. There are some other options for this um, shared seam indicator. To view this, you do have to be in edge mode. In fact, if I select all the edges, so control A, we can see where all of the uh, lines are indicating connected and shared edges. But if we go to edit, preferences dialog, and go down to here, we've got this uh, value under seams edge pair markers count. Now it's currently set to 10,000. So this is the amount of these lines that can be displayed in um, Ryzen UV in general. So if you've got a lot of islands and a lot of uh, connections, they will be displayed. Uh, if you don't want them displayed, you can actually drop this right down to zero if needs be. So if I turn that down to zero, you can see that these will disappear. 
So let's put this back up to 10,000. Uh, the other thing you can do is adjust this color. Um, here it says seam, seams edge pair markers color. So if you don't like this kind of dark teal, you can change this. I'm actually quite happy with this color, so I'm gonna leave it well alone. Something else that's new in the preferences dialog, if we come down here, under units, we've got default scene unit. Now mine's set to centimeters, and uh, you can actually set this explicitly within Ryzen UV itself. I'll show you that in a sec. But when you open Ryzen UV, you can set it so it's default scene units or whatever you want it to be. Mine are currently centimeters, and that makes sense for me because in Cinema 4D, if we go back to that quickly, um, you can see that this box here, its size is 200 centimeters by 200 centimeters by 200 centimeters, and its default unit in Cinema 4D is in centimeters. And if I go back to Ryzen UV, you can see if we move this out of the way that here we have our box at the top and you can see 200, 200, 200, and it's centimeters. Now, usually when you export an FBX into Ryzen UV, it will automatically detect what the uh, scene units are for that model. This is not true of um, OBJs. So here you can set what you want the default scene unit to be of Ryzen when, when you first open it. And then if you import a model, it should pick up the model's um, scene units if it's an FBX. If it isn't, you can set it explicitly here. So you've got a drop down and you can explicitly set the scene units there. Oh, let's put that back to centimeters. There we go. Something else that's worth having a look at is the relationship between the margin, uh, the padding and the map res. So if I was to go into map res and I can just press shift ax asterisk, which is basically times and then put two, it will times that by two, but you'll notice that my margin increased and so did my padding. They basically doubled just as my map res did. So if I undo this, you can see that it's 2048. I'll do that again. Keep an eye on the margin in the padding and you'll see that they double as well. So basically it tries to keep the ratio of these things um, consistent between each other. So let me just undo that to bring it back to the standard 2048. Um, with that said, the, these can be changed independently. So if I wanted a margin that was much bigger, I could put 16 there. And if I wanted this to be bigger, let's times this by two, so we get 32. And there we have it. And then if we did a repack, you can see that the distance between our islands, which is the padding, is now much bigger and we have a bigger margin too. Okay, you can uh, see that I've imported some disks, some flat disks into the scene, and there's a good reason for that. So let's uh, just unwrap and pack these, and you can see this is how they're laid out on the UV space. Now, the reason I've done this is because I wanna talk about this up here, this outline function. Now, to explain what this does, that's why these disks were necessary. Once I've packed these disks in the UV space, you can see that they've been arranged in such a way that they utilize as much as the, as the UV space as possible. This large disk here has actually got a boundary around its edge, and that determines how close these can get, along, along with the padding value as well. You can see that this has got as close to this as possible without intersecting with the margin value or the padding value. So it packs them in a very nice, neat way, which brings me onto the outline functionality. Now, when I originally saw this, I thought outline, what does it do, put an outline around it or something like that, and it doesn't. It's not actually something that's displayed. This is about how boundaries are dealt with for islands. So if I go into island mode and select this large disc, you can see that this is no longer grayed out and I can actually turn this on. So that's actually, on for this island now if i select another island you'll see that it's not on if i go back to this you can see that it is and what this actually does instead of having the normal boundary for this island which is its mesh basically the boundary of the actual shape it tries to simplify it so now the boundary for this object will actually be a square so the boundary line will travel from here 
all the way to about here until it gets to sort of like the intersection of this furthest extremity and this furthest extremity. So it'll be out here and the same for all corners. So there's actually like a bounding box around this now. So if I try and pack this now, you can see that these other shapes no longer interact with this like they were before. You can, if you imagine this imaginary bounding box, you can see that it will travel along here. And that's why this shape is no longer trying to occupy areas within that. So it, this is a way to, I should imagine, simplify packing and also give your islands a little bit more breathing room for whatever reason that may be. You may have a reason in your texturing program or something like that. But I just wanted to make you aware that this outline feature is here and this is what it does. Okay, I've got some new uh, geometry in my scene now. And the reason for this is because I want to go over topo copy. So if you look on the right hand side here, you'll see topo copy and stack and you can unfold this and you'll see a load of options that are currently grayed out. And that's because we currently have nothing selected. So let's have a look at this stuff. Let's go over it. So the first thing I'm going to do is actually hide the ball in the middle to um, free up some room. You just hover over the object and press H. And I'm also going to isolate one of these so it makes it easier to make our cut. So I'm just going to hover over this one and press I. And that isolates it. And then I'm going to make a seam cut by double clicking here. And that will go up the entire length there. And then I will do the same here. And to add to our selection, we hold the shift key down, double click, double click here as well double click here and I'm going to leave this connected so it's kind of like a hinge it's like a little this will be a flap and I'm going to do the same thing up here as well so shift double click double click double click and again we'll leave that as the hinge and uh, we'll come out of isolation by going in an empty space and press I again it will bring all the others back now I've got this edge selected, you'll see that one of these has opened up and it says select similar. So this is actually a lot like the old way of doing this type of thing was, I think it was called select similar cuts. So now we've got this edge selected, I can press select similar and it will select everything that it deems similar in the scene. And now obviously I could press the C key to cut and then, I don't know, unfold, zoom in by pressing F to frame everything. And you'll see that all of these similar islands are now unfolded and packed. This is a lot like the old way of doing things, which was select similar cuts. But there is actually a better way, an improved way. And actually, I want to go through what some of this stuff means as well. So let's back up, uh, Control Z, and we'll just get back to where we had one cut. So let's talk a little bit about these settings at the top here. So the topology reference, you can see it's set to uncut or cut. And what that means is, what is the geometry that it's going to be referencing to determine what's similar? And all it means is, are you going to be looking at the original geometry, so what you've got in the 3D view, or are you going to be looking at the 2D space where the you know it's been flattened out or whatever? I tend to leave it on uncut. Uh, I've had no problems so far. Uh, the symmetry mode is set to straight. Say I've got this uh, object that I've got this cut selected on, and then next to it, there's an identical object in terms of geometry, but its normal orientation is reversed. Well, for it to de detect that correctly, um, you can actually set this to symmetric or both. I've not had an issue with this so far, so I'm going to leave it as it is. Island source. So we've got a slider here and you can see it's set all the way up to this top. So it's basically saying how similar do the islands have to be for me to recognize it as something that needs to be selected or processed. I've never had a problem so far. It works absolutely brilliantly with this quite high. And if you find that it doesn't quite catch something, you can just lower this down uh, slightly. It's almost like a threshold slider for similarity. Okay, so now that we've gone over that, um, we can have a look at this other stuff, which is currently grayed out. So now I've got one of these selected. What I can actually do is make a cut. So I'm going to hover over this object, press C to cut that. Still hovering over it, I'm going to press U and then P. And you can see here that it's packed, well, everything. But this is the only one that's been unfolded. So you're probably thinking, so what? 
Well, the great thing about uh, topo copy is now if we go into island mode and select this island that we've cut, you can see that it's opened up a whole bunch of other options to us now. So instead of uh, using select similar, by the way, you can still use this. So if I, even in island mode, if I click select similar, it will select everything that it deems to be geometrically similar to the shape I had chosen in the first place. Um, so I'm just going to control Z. But we've now got this button here, which is update similar. So what does that mean exactly, update similar? It will not only look at how this piece of geometry has been cut, but it will also look at its status in terms of its unfolded state. So with this island selected, let's just press update similar. And now you can see that everything else that it deems similar has now got the exact same cut or cuts and they've been unfolded in exactly the same manner. So if I go here and just pack everything, you can see that they've got identical cuts. They've been laid out exactly the same. Okay, we've got a few other options in uh, topo copy as well. So if I select my island again, we've got a couple of options down here. This one, stack similar. So if I click on this, it will look at all the similar islands to the one that I have selected, all the similar geometry in the 3D view. And it will go find all the similar geometry and then stack them on top of each other in the UV space. So if I click that, they're all now stacked upon each other. And obviously, if you press P again, they're all going to be spread out. So to prevent that, you've also got the option of this, which is stack, similar, and then group. So if I do that, they're now in a group together. And if I unselect and just pack everything, these will remain stacked within their group. OK, let's talk about the Magnet Weld tool. I've got the same model here. It's just been completely unwrapped. Um, so let's zoom in here. We're in edge mode. Now, I'm sure you're all aware of how just regular welding works. If I select all these edges, you can see their connections here. And if I hit the W key, it will weld these two objects together. And then you can unfold them again and pack them again. So let's undo this and have a look up here at the magnet weld tool. Now, this is slightly different from just welding because if I grab this island here and move it away, and do the same thing, edge mode, and just hit the W key, which is basically hitting this weld button here, they will still be welded together. Distance doesn't really matter. But with the magnet weld tool, you can actually set a threshold. So I'm just gonna move these back together again. So with this edge selected, I've got this magnet weld set at this value here. So if, it, if I hit the button for it, you can see that nothing happens. So let's select these edges again and try a different value. I'm going to put this up to 0 0.025 and let's hit the button again. Now we can see that something has happened. And as it turns out, these edges here were within this threshold, but these edges that were selected on the outside were not. And that's why they haven't been welded. So if you want a little bit more control over how things are welded, um, you can use the magnet weld. Another new addition to Ryzen UV is Polyloop. So I'm sure we're all familiar, um, you've actually seen me do it during this video, that when we're in edge mode, if I go onto an edge and double click, it will loop the edge. Well, you can now do this with polygons. So if I go into polygon mode, if I go to this edge here and double click, it will actually select all the polys above and below it until it hits a border or, or something that stops the loop in its tracks. And if I wanted to select a loop in the other direction, I could just click on, uh, click on this edge instead. Uh, it can be done in both windows as well. So if I come up here, hover over this edge, I can select that. And obviously if you hold shift, you can add to your selection, much like this. So that's just like a nice new addition to Ryzen UV that definitely helps workflow become a little faster. Okay, let's have a look at creating a color ID map. Uh, color ID maps are really helpful, particularly when using in third party software, something like Substance Painter, because what it allows you to do is identify parts of your model really, really quickly without having to pick through um, and make polygon selections or island selections or 
or anything else. In fact, your selections may be even more complicated than that. And a color ID map really, really helps with that. And now you can do that in Ryzen UV. So if we go down to the bottom here where it says distortion and hold this drop down and go to color ID map, everything will turn white and you'll have a bunch of options in terms of colors and stuff. So what I'm going to do is select all of these islands. Uh, I need to be in island mode first, that'd help. So I'll select all of these islands and I can just click on a color that's already in this palette here. So click red and now all of these islands, in fact the entire object here, is red. That will be reflected in the 3D view and the 2D view. If you don't like what's in the palette here, you can actually add your own colors to the palette or choose your own custom colors. So if I choose all of these islands here and then open uh, this up, I can actually use either, either the RGB sliders or the hue, saturation and lightness sliders to create a new color. So let's go with something like that, that'll do. We'll choose apply. You have to tick this button here, this tick button, and then that color will be assigned to all your islands. So let's do the same thing with these as well. And I'll just choose something from the palette, this green, and now they're all green. You can also assign colors, uh, random colors actually, using island groups and materials, and you can even do that up here. Uh, if I open this uh, dialog, you can do it by material sets as well. I've only got one default material on this object, but if you export it from your 3D program, with uh, several materials, you can actually you can actually do it via this as well. So once you've got your color map sorted out, you need to get it out of Ryzen UV, and this will be done in Files. Go down to Export UV. It will ask for an output file path. So let's go choose one of those. So I've got mine in Test. We'll just call our file name Test as well. And click save and now that's up here we've got some options here we've got non-empty tiles and selected tiles i've only got one tile and it is non-empty so that's fine um the width and height i've already set it to 1024 pixels print resolution so this is like the dpi and then we're going to need a channel so i'm going to enable channel a there's the output path it'll ask what the background color is i think this is white by default but i prefer mine to be black Polygon rendering is off, so I'm going to change this to color ID map. Uh, you've got some options here about anti-aliasing and padding. I'm going to leave them alone. Edge rendering. I've turned this off because I'm not interested in um, rendering out the edges. I just need the color. That's pretty much it. So if I hit export all enabled files, you saw that add a very quick thing down the bottom there. And that should be exported now. So if I go and open this folder, you can see we've now got our color ID map and we'll just open that up and there you go. Okay, let's talk groups. Um, you can now name your groups in Rise of UV. I'm just gonna go into island mode, grab all these here, group these together. You can do that by pressing the shortcut G or this button up here. Let's press G and now we've got a group. Like I said, we can rename these now. So if we actually select the group itself, so just to let you know what these labels mean, this is group zero and this is the content within it. So if I select group zero, I've actually selected the group container itself. And if I select the content, you're selecting everything inside it. So let's select the group. And then if we come up here, there's a big R, rename, and we can actually rename this anything we like now. So let's just call this hello. And now we've got hello as a group name. So that's a lovely, nice addition. Uh, you can also nest groups now as well. So for instance, if I was to grab two of the islands within the group already, so I've already got a group, there's stuff in it, and then press G again, you can see that it's group zero nested. So these are now within this group. So if I wanted to pack the content, it would include this group as content. And as you can see, it gets shifted around when packed. Let me just control Z so we don't have these as a nested group. There we go. Okay, so that's a good case. If you've already got a group and you want to group within it, that's fine. You can 
do what I just did. But what if you've got a group and you've already got a group outside of it that you want to nest in there? So if I grab all this stuff here and then press G, we've got a secondary group here. Now, what if I want these to be nested inside of this? Well, what you'd do is you'd um, select that group's content and move it within this group. And in fact, I'm probably going to have to resize this like this. Select the content, pack it so it's all in there. So now this group is wholly within this group here. So with this group selected, so make sure you've got the group selected and then go up here to the add button and we can click that. And now you can see that this has changed to group zero nested. So that's how you get an external group to be in, in another group. Okay, let's talk locking logic. It used to be the case in Ryzen UV that if you locked an island, when you packed it would remain in its place. But the problem with that was that if you optimized or unwrapped those locked islands would still be effective. So it was a little bit counterintuitive, but now the locking logic has changed. So let's go into island mode and select everything actually. And I'm going to hold space so I can move these out of the way. I'm just going to grab one of these islands and bring it back. And I'm going to resize it. So holding space, middle mouse button, and I'm going to bring it up so it's a bigger size. I'm going to put it in our UV space and then I'm going to go up here in the island and group panel and we've got this little padlock here and that'll lock my island and if I unselect it you'll see that it's now black in both these viewports letting us know that it is now locked. Now if I come in here and press pack everything packs around it and this doesn't move so this is the kind of locking behavior you'd, you'd expect. So let's grab this and unlock it and I'm going to do something else to it as well. I am going to pinch this so I'm going to start doing stuff like this to it. And I'm also going to lock it again. And then let's pack again. And if I was to go to the optimize brush and optimize some of these islands, you can see not, not much has changed. You can see a little bit of movement here, but it is not affecting the locked island whatsoever. So anything related to unwrapping and optimizing anything al algorithmic that you could do to an island now can't be done you can still however if i go back make sure island mode is selected we'll go to edit select as well and um, select this island we can still actually transform this ourselves so if i hold the space bar down and right click my mouse i can still rotate it i can still size it up and i can still move it so even though it's locked the user themselves can make changes to the transforms of this locked object. It just won't be affected by algorithmic input. In fact, let's check if we can use the inflate brush on this. Now it's locked. And no, no, I can't. It has absolutely no effect on it. So like I said, anything algorithmic is now hidden from this locked item, but the user can still transform it themselves. There are a couple of other things worth noting. The info bar at the bottom here, that is now color coded. If Ryzen UV determines that it needs to display just information to you, the color will be blue for this bar. If it's a warning or an error, it will be orange and red. It makes it a lot clearer if something's happening that you need to be aware of. Something else is material numbers and object numbers are now listed. So if I open up the dialog here, you will see that if I select this, it has a number at the top. So it's saying that you've got one material selected and same with the objects. And if I select two, it will say two objects. This is extremely helpful because if you've got a long list of objects or a long list of materials and you want to know how many there are or how many you've got selected, you don't have to go through the list and count them now. You can just grab them look at the top and it will tell you exactly what that number is. Okay, let's talk scaling. You can see that I've returned to this simple half box shape, you know, very simple. And the reason for that is because we're trying to deal with uh, grasping a concept. The geometry itself actually doesn't really matter. Uh, what we're interested in is understanding how scaling works. So 
bit of background. There used to be something in Ryzen UV called AutoFit. Now, if AutoFit was enabled, Ryzen UV would try to scale the items down or scale them up so they fit inside the UV tile and utilize the maximum amount of space possible. If you had AutoFit turned off, Ryzen UV would not do this. Well, now AutoFit is a thing of the past and has been replaced by something called scaling. So if we look up here in the packing properties panel, we'll see that we have min scaling and we have max scaling. These are currently both set to free, which I think is the default setting in uh, Ryzen UV 2022. And uh, what this means is both of these being set to free is basically the equivalent of the old auto fit. So I can demonstrate that now by making sure I'm in island mode, selecting these tiles. And if I hold space and middle mouse click and scale these down, unselect and press P for pack, you'll see that they've been scaled up, which is determined by this max scaling setting to make sure that they utilize as much as the UV tile as possible. And if I reselect these, and scale them up, unselect and press P. This minimum scaling value is free. It is free to scale these islands down and make sure they utilize uh, as much as the UV tile as possible too. So when both of these are set to free, it's very much like the behavior of having auto fit on. So what about when we used to turn auto fit off? What is the equivalent of that now? Well. I select these islands again, and let's just for argument's sake, scale them down. And we set both of these to 100%. What this basically means is for minimum scaling, you can scale down to a maximum of 100% of its original size. So 100% of something's original size is just its original size. And the same for the max scaling as well. If you were to press P now, you'd expect to see no change whatsoever. And that's exactly what happens. It moves it into this corner, but they're exactly the same size. So you may be thinking, well, okay, what's the point then? And it's because you've got so much more control now. If we have a look at the minimum scaling, yeah, sure, we've got three and we've got 100%, but we've got a gradient in between as well. And the same goes for max scaling. So to demonstrate what I mean, I'm going to put min scaling on three. And we're just going to look at max scaling for now. In fact, for now, let's put that on three as well. I'm going to scale these up slightly so they cover a bit more space. Let's uh, move these as well. Let's choose a new max scaling. So like I said, 100%, they should remain at 100%, and they do. Okay, so let's change this to something like 110%. Now what we're saying is you can scale up to 110% of the island's original size, this being the island's original size. So let's pack again and the islands have got bigger by 10%. Now, this is basically its baseline, its original size. So if I was to pack again, it would add another 10% on this size, and you can keep going like this. So I'm just gonna rewind a little bit. There we go. So that's what this max scaling does. It puts a cap on how much it can be scaled up by. And the same is true, let's uh, take this back to three. The same is true for the min scaling as well. This is like a cap of how much it can be scaled down. So we're going to need to go in the other direction. So if I grab all these islands and maybe move them off to one side, in fact, let's uh, scale these bad boys up. So you can see in relation to the UV tile, they're quite big. And we, oh, I don't know, we set these to 100%. Obviously, none of these islands are going to be scaled down because they've been capped at 100% of their current size. So if I press P, oh, well, what's happened? Well, actually, this got bigger, and that's because our max scaling is set to free. That's why. If I was to revert this and change this to 100% as well, no change. It's just one of these islands has been moved into the UV space. Now, the reason that these other islands haven't been moved at all is because there is no room for them. If I had several more UDIM tiles, each of these islands would be distributed in them. It would recognize that it couldn't fit this island in this tile, so it would spill over to the next tile. Okay, so let me rewind that. I'm going to put the min scaling on something like, I don't know, 80% and pack again. And you can see that it's scaled down a lot more, but it still doesn't have enough room for these tiles in there either. 
So let's rewind and scale down to something like 50. This time, the cap was low enough to get all of these within this UV tile. Okay, let's return these to free. And the reason that I wanted to do that is because you can actually set the min scaling and max scaling independently for each island. So if I was to select this island, in fact, let's make this a little bit more interesting. Let's select all of them and scale them down. And then move them anywhere we like, really. Um, if I was to grab this tile and say, you can be scaled up to, I don't know, 130% of this size, you'll see that now we've got an S130. That tell, tells us our maximum scaling. And if we set our min scaling, we can say, oh, you can be scaled down to, I don't know, 30%. You'll see that we've got another value in here now. So the min scaling is signified by this small s, and the large s is the max scaling, 130. And if I was to click off this, that now information now disappears from this, but it's still visible here. So let's just pack. And as you can see, this tile here has gotten bigger by this max scaling factor. These are obviously much bigger because these are set to free. So these are free to do whatever they want, and these have been locked to this uh, scaling factor that we've entered there. Let's go back one. We can even give these different ones if we wanted to. So we can say, hey, you can go down to, you know, 5% of your current size, and you can increase by, I don't know, say 160%. And if we pack now, we can see the difference between these two. This one's still set to free. And again, we can give this some values as well. Um, let's say 175. Let, actually, let's get a little bit more drastic. 200. And then pack again. So you can really control how big your islands are. So there you go, guys. That's my update video that takes us all the way up to Ryzen UV 2022. Uh, there are more that I'd like to dig into, and hopefully I'll be doing that in future videos. But I hope you found that helpful, and I'll see you in the next one. If you're watching on YouTube, please like and subscribe. And don't forget to hit that bell to be notified of new tutorials. You can follow me on social media at Facebook, Twitter, LinkedIn and Instagram. And make sure to visit me at digitalmeet.uk where you can vote for upcoming tutorials. Thanks for watching. Bye.